Good afternoon and welcome to Justice That's Just. I'm Candace Jones, President and CEO of the Public Welfare Foundation. And on behalf of our entire team and our board, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here. We had a lot of conversations about whether or not we wanted to add to the noise of this moment in history. What I know for sure is that each one of us in our respective lives, in the last 18 months, we have been through some things. But we decided that we wanted to bring our partners together to remind us all that we have community. That's what this conversation is designed to do. Justice That's Just is about reminding all of us that the thing that we're working towards is not a moonshot. It is the full realization of something already promised by this nation. All the speakers that you hear are designed just to support that mission. We're not asking you this afternoon to be stronger, to push harder, to go further. We know you're already doing that. We actually hope this afternoon's conversation sparks joy, reminds you that you are not alone in this work, that we can all still collectively learn and enjoy ourselves, and that if you need to take a rest, we'll all be here when you get back. Our first speaker this afternoon is Kelly Carter Jackson, an academic who every time I hear her speak or read her writing, it invites me to think deeper about an issue. She writes about black activist movements throughout history, forcing us to deal with the relationship between power and violence and to examine those historical movements as we think about the movements that we've yet to see. The second panel is designed just to remind you that in this work, you are not alone. Whether you're Richard Morales in Colorado, working to take money out of the deep end prison system and reinvest it in a community continuum of care, growing a fund from $500,000 to more than 7 million and ensuring that more than 60% of the people employed in the program are formerly incarcerated. Perhaps you're Mark Mertens, our partner in Wisconsin, who's a juvenile justice system leader, who's working right now on a plan to zero out the number of youth in custody, ensuring that Milwaukee's children are served in Milwaukee neighborhoods. Or maybe you're Patrice Sultan, who just launched the DC Justice Lab, working on a model criminal code that demystifies those laws for the citizens that are governed by them. She's ensuring that black and brown people have agency and access to that process. Or maybe you're Ernest Johnson at Mbutu Village who trains parents on how to navigate the juvenile justice system, reminding them that they have power and they are not alone. That conversation will be moderated by Athena Robinson Mark, our partner from Communities for Just Schools. And it is designed to remind you that you have power and you are not alone in this work. The final conversation will be between myself and Amanda Alexander at the Detroit Justice Center and Gina Clayton Johnson at SE Justice Group in California. Both of them have started organizations where they baked black feminist principles into the mission ensuring that those organizations are thinking about how to take care of their staff, take care of themselves, and by extension, take care of the people that they're working on behalf of. I'm thrilled to have you here. Grab your cup, whether or not you got a justice mug or not, sit back and enjoy this conversation that we are about to have. I can assure you three things will happen this afternoon. One, somebody's gonna say something that inspires you. Two, there might be a tech glitch. It is that moment in history, y'all. In the spirit of this conversation, sit back, have some grace about it, and laugh. Our amazing group at Meeting Tomorrow will get us back online in no time. And three, there's going to be mutiny at the Public Welfare Foundation, y'all, because they're going to be coming for me about some Black feminist principles in our mission, but I'm ready for it, and that is all right. 
a couple of housekeeping things this afternoon. Listen, if we want to hear from you, we're glad that you're here. If you want to comment, tell us how you're feeling, join the conversation by telling us what's in your mind, join the chat. If you have a question, something that you want to put to myself or one of the panelists, each one of the conversations will end with a Q&A session. Please drop that, a thing that ends with a question mark and is designed to elicit a response into the Q&A. Please also join us in the conversation on social media. Be sure to hashtag justice that's just, tag the Public Welfare Foundation or any one of our incredible speakers this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we're thrilled to have you here. Let's have some peace and enjoy ourselves. And with that, I am thrilled, over the moon thrilled to introduce our first speaker to you. Every time I hear this woman, I think about things that I think I already know in a whole new way. Ms. Kelly Carter Jackson. Hi. Hi, everyone. That is not your Zoom. That is me just pausing dramatically. Hey, Kelly, because I want to make sure I put appropriate respect on your name. Okay, ma'am. Give me just a second. I want to read a little bit and I'm going to read this, you guys, because I want to make sure I get this right. Kelly is Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College. Her book, Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence was the first historical analysis focused on the use of violence among antebellum Black activists. Force and Freedom won the James Broussard Best First Book Prize and was a finalist for the Frederick Douglass Book Prize. Her essays have been featured in, wait for it, Times, Post, Atlantic, Guardian, the Los Angeles Times, NPR Times, The Conversation, and Boston's local NPR affiliate. All I need is a DMXB. And then she has also been a contributing speaker on MSNBC, Sky News, UK, Times, Guardian, PBS, Box, HuffPost, C-SPAN, BBC, Algeria, and the Slate, to name a few. She is the mother of three beautiful Black children, all named for Black abolitionists, which I love. Married to a man she's known since she was seven. She's bad, y'all, and just getting started. Kelly, I'm so glad to have you here. How are you? I'm great. That is probably the best introduction I have ever had. I have to go because you spark joy for me. So I'm so glad to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I cannot um, say how grateful I am to just share some of my thoughts, words, ideas with you. I'm so, so happy. Um, I know we're talking about joy today and I just want to like say before I get started, before I get into all of this, how much it just brings me joy to be able to talk about these issues with people that care, with people that are invested, with people that are doing the work. So um, even though I can't see you, I'm feeding off your energy. <laughs> I hope you're feeding off mine and, and we're going to have a good time today. It's going to be really empowering. All right. I love it. I'll be back to join you in the Q&A as Kelly is giving her presentation. Join us again in the Q&A section with questions and let us know how you're feeling in the chat. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. I'm I'm actually setting my timer because I do not want to be a <laughs> minister and go on for two, three like hours. I did. I'm sure I'm over my five minutes. <laughs> always, always checking my time. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, let's make sure this pops up. There we go. I hope everyone can see all of this. So uh, let's just dive in. Looking back to move forward, a history of violence and joy in America. Um, so this talk for me started last year, as I'm sure many of you know, the world, or at least throughout America and actually all around the world, kind of got turned upside down in what people have been calling this racial reckoning. And I wrote an op-ed in The Atlantic about this moment and about how we should think about not just George Floyd, but violence and protest in general. And so I started the article with thinking all the way back because I'm a historian and I can't tell any story without invoking history. I started thinking about the genesis of this country and I started thinking about how much we condemn violence, but also how much we love violence, 
how much we romanticize violence, how when we think of the American Revolution, we have these ideas of give me liberty or give me death. And we talk about the Boston Tea Party and we talk about the Boston um, Massacre and how much we are a nation founded on protest, political protest. And because I live uh, outside of Boston, all of this just resonates so much with me because K through 12 students are given this history of the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution and Concord and Lexington. And we have really this I think seductive relationship with violence that we've not always been honest about. So I wanted to use that op-ed and use a lot of my research and writings to sort of tease out these contradictions and talk about what they really mean. We have had a historical double standard, not just in the way that we talk about history, but in the way that we're presented history. When we talk about what is known as the age of revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution, the American Revolution is like front and center. But often the Haitian Revolution, which involved, you know, free Black people, enslaved Black people rising up for their liberation, that, that moment almost is a footnote in our understanding. It's not something that we readily recall. But in the age of revolutions, it was really the only revolution that pushed uh, for, for full emancipation of all enslaved people, that actually pushed for liberty and democracy and justice. Um, but oftentimes we don't talk about the Haitian revolution or we only talk about it in terms of its heinous acts, in terms of the gratuitous violence. We talk about you know, Haitian leaders as though they're, they're, they're boogeymans that have haunted you know, Europe up and killed Europeans. And I found all of this to be pretty incredible, even when we talk about the history of slave rebellions. All throughout history, especially in America, slave rebellions are told from a place of fear and terror and trauma. It's never about Black liberation. It's never uh, taken from the standpoint of Black humanity. Even in these pictures right here, these old um, uh, sketchings, you'll notice that all of the white people, their faces and their features are, are drawn in. But all of the black people in this are, they're like just blobs, they're shadows, they're, they're these, um, you know, really dark, uh, less than human, um, you know, terroristic re rebels. That is how it is portrayed. And so that history, that historical context, has really shaped how we have understood protest depending upon who's doing the protesting. So I always use this clip because I think these two images, because I think they pair so well. Um, and this comes from a quote I, I didn't create it. This is Khalil Muhammad, uh, Khalil Jabbar Muhammad, who talks about in his book, The Condemnation of Blackness. He says, there's a prevailing myth that white people commit crimes, but black people are criminals. White people commit crimes, but Black people are criminals. Meaning that when white people do something, well, that's not really who they are, right? That's not their identity. But before Black people can even commit a crime, no, that's who they are. They are criminals. So when we see this instance of Michigan State, and this is Michigan State, when it wins a game, when it loses a game, when it ties a game, right? Like this is Austin, like, you know, the Boston Red Sox. There are a lot of cities that are notorious for turning over their cities with a victory or a loss. But then when we look at Baltimore and we look at the death of Freddie Gray, who died in police custody, these images are very similar. But the one uh, on the right, the one with the college students is sort of a boys will be boys kind of. White people are committing crimes. That's not who they are. They're college students. They're happy. They're excited. This just happens. But when we think about Baltimore, it's, these are thugs. These are looters. These are punks. There's a completely different narrative that takes place when we look at violence. Uh, I think that, you know, maybe in the past two or three years, we've started to have these conversations about what it means to really tease out political violence and acts of riots and rebellion and looting and unrest and look at the heart of it. What is causing it? What is motivating it? And what are people responding to? So I use um, this image a lot because I think that 
you know, there's a there's a line in the op-ed I write about when I'm telling my mother last year when people were protesting over George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, I said to my mom, I just had a baby and I said, I want to be out in the streets. I want to be protesting. I want to be out there. But um, I didn't feel safe from a, from a health perspective, having just given birth, uh, but also from a pandemic perspective as well. And my mom said to me something that really disheartened me. She said, this happened in 1968. The same thing happened when I was your age. Don't worry, just keep on living. You'll get your chance. And I was like, I don't want another chance. I don't want another opportunity to be out in the streets. I don't want to feel like I'm missing, you know, a, a carnival. I want to bring about change. And it's so interesting that when we don't take into effect history, when we don't realize mistakes that have been made or how history can serve as a roadmap, as an echo, as a blueprint for how we might go forward. Um, I think we miss out on a lot. I think not only do we miss out on a lot, but we repeat the same things over and over and over again. Um, and I don't want my children to grow up and be in a similar position as me where I'm saying to them, don't worry, you'll get another chance. So a lot of my ideas have come from this place of trying to use history as a tool, as a way of understanding how we might stop the injustice that we all live in and how we might use history as not just a way to understand how we might go forward, but a way to understand how we cannot commit the same atrocities. Um, so I want us to think about some questions and I'm just gonna pull them all up right here. But I want us to really think about what is violence? What is violence? How have we made this word sort of a catch-all? I think there's a tremendous difference between a cop car being turned upside down, a cop car even set on fire, and the bullet that killed Breonna Taylor and the knee to the neck to George Floyd. We should be able to distinguish the destruction of property and the death of people as two different things. Um, and that to me has caused me to say, we have to be specific about what violence is. And we should not hold people and property on the same playing field. The second question is how should the oppressed respond to their oppressors? What is the appropriate response? I study the abolitionists. So when I'm looking at enslaved people or fugitives, and I think to myself, well, they didn't have the vote. Not really, they didn't have citizenship. How do you respond to your oppression, to your oppressors, when you don't have access to the traditional channels that would push you towards change in a, in a nonviolent way? I think about the role of the state. I think about how should the nation respond to political dissent? What is the responsibility of the government to respond to its people? What is the pro appropriate response to its people when these uprests and uprisings and rebellions take place? And then I think about violence, if it is ever justified, if we can think of moments when, yeah, violence was something useful, something effective, uh, when is that? For me, it's it's slavery. Uh, the abolitionists rationalized that since slavery was created by violence, since it was sustained by violence, it only made sense that it would be overthrown by violence. But I want to talk about the ways in which we have justified violence throughout history. And then lastly, this kind of ties into the third question, but how do the powerless procure power? How can the powerless procure power? Is that possible? And if so, what does that look like? Um, so these are the questions that I just want us to frame and we can come back in the Q&A, but I think they're worth thinking about. So uh, as mentioned before, my book is Force and Freedom, uh, shameless plug, <laughs> Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence. But one of the things that I'm always pointing out is that, you know, they were called the abolitionists not the reformers, <laughs> like not the reformers. They were not trying to reform slavery or make good masters. They were trying to abolish, eradicate, dismantle the entire institution of slavery. And what I love about the abolitionists is that they are so representative of all of America. They were men, they were women, they were black, they were white, they were born free or fugitives or formerly enslaved. Um, and all of them, poor or wealthy, played a unique and special role 
and represent actually a very, very small percentage of the population. Um, in terms of moving um, the, uh, the system of slavery into oblivion. Um, and so for me, the abolitionists and their strategies and their tool books have been so helpful in thinking about how we might take some of their own ideas and implement them um, in our current moment. I think about what Joshua Easton said, who's a famous Black abolitionist. He says this in 1870, um, 1837. He says, abolitionists may attack slaveholding, but there's a danger still that the spirit of slavery will survive in the form of prejudice after our system is overturned. Our warfare ought not to be against slavery alone, but against the spirit which makes color a mark of degradation. The spirit which makes color a mark of degradation. Basically saying like, you, you can abolish slavery, but if you don't deal with anti-Blackness, if you don't deal with the spirit of slavery, these systems, these ideas, these discrimination, discriminatory practices will still be with us. Um, and he's not wrong. In a lot of ways, I think of this quote as being so prophetic. It's so telling about how things have changed or not changed because we have failed to address the spirit of slavery. And what do I mean by the spirit of slavery? When I mean the spirit of slavery, I'm talking about housing and segregation and health care and education and mass incarceration, police brutality, wealth gap, voting rights and suppression, hiring practice, beauty politics, our friendships. Like to me, nothing has really exploded the spirit of slavery more than the pandemic because we have gotten to see real racial inequities, real economic inequities, all throughout America at every single level, the pandemic has laid bare this spirit of slavery, this mark of degradation, this anti-Blackness that we are all still grappling with to this day. But I also think, again, going back to the abolitionists, that Frederick Douglass says something to me that's so uh, revealing, so powerful. He's talking about the causes of rebellion and he's, he's giving this about a year or so after the Civil War um, has ended, about a year after the 13th Amendment has passed. Um, and Douglas says, there's a cause to be thankful, even for rebellion, it is an impressive teacher, though a stern and terrible one. And then he cautioned us to remember that the thing worse than rebellion is the thing that causes rebellion. The thing worse than rebellion is the thing that causes rebellion. And for me, it summarizes so much of the anger and the rage that we have been experiencing in this past year, past years, and that sometimes the media and others push this narrative of the rebellion and never the causes of the rebellion. And they teach us that the most thing we need to fear is, is turned over cop cars or things set on fire, but not the causes that motivated that violence, that rage, that anger. So we don't discuss um, you know, the, the, the roots of police brutality. We don't discuss mass incarceration. We don't discuss police brutality. We don't discuss you know, black health disparities. Uh, we just look at the rebellion itself, the anger itself, and we make the anger the problem and not the cause of the anger. Um, so I wanna give us some staggering statistics because I think these really color or paint a better picture for why the causes of rebellion um, compel people to have these responses. You know, when I think about 2020 alone, one to two black people are actually killed per week by the police every single week. When I think about these numbers in terms of history, when we think about the nadir, which is the early 20th century period between 1896 and about 1915, in which two Black people are lynched per week, uh, when that is your reality, when at any moment uh, something violent could happen to you, that, that statistic is a scary one. It's a terrifying one. And it's one that orients all of your movement in the world. Um, in Massachusetts, the state that I live in, you know, there are not a lot of Black people. We're about 7% of the population, but about 27% of the prison population. So how is it that 7% of the population, but one in four of us are locked up? These numbers aren't organic. 
they don't just happen. It's not, oh, so unfortunate. This is orchestrated, not organic, but orchestrated um, oppression against marginalized people, poor people, people of color. When I think about economic inequalities and I think about the Boston Globe and how they had this um, article that debuted a few years ago in which they talked about the average net wealth of a white family uh, in Boston was over two hundred thousand dollars. I can't, I can't even, I can't even get my head around that. Two hundred thousand dollars, but the average net worth for Black families is like eight cents. And then the 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 subtext was, no, that's not a typo. Like eight cents. Effectively, Black Black people have no wealth. They have no wealth, and certainly not compared to their white counterparts. And then the next statistic, which so many of us um, know all too well, is the disproportionate rates of Black and Indigenous and people of color that have been dying from COVID-19 and are still dying despite the vaccine in disproportionate rates. Um, and these are just a few. You know, I tried to pull from from health and wealth and incarceration. These are just a few relics of the spirit of slavery. Um, so I know we always talk about this in terms of white privilege. White privilege has become all the rage, rage lately, but I think it's such a powerful component to understanding racism. Oftentimes we don't, or we only talk about racism in terms of its disadvantages, in terms of the harm it causes. We don't talk about racism in terms of its profitability. We don't talk about racism in terms of how it benefits certain groups of people. And so when we talk about white privilege, I really want to make clear that this is not about, you know, your life being easy, you're not having to work hard if you're white. It's about your skin color not being one of the things that makes it harder. It's about that mark of degradation not applying to your personhood. Um, and this is what I think we have to constantly keep in mind. Um, so Jen Chudy, She's a colleague of mine at uh, Wellesley College, a really good friend and a brilliant political scientist. You may have heard her on NPR's Code Switch last week. If you haven't, check out the episode. It is so, so good. It's still sitting with me. It's so powerful. Um, but she's done a lot of research about white attitudes uh, towards politics and right, white attitudes toward other groups. And in her research, she found that only one in five white Americans consistently express high levels of sympathy about racial discrimination against Black Americans, only one in five. She said that many Americans have chosen places to live, places to send their children to school, places to vacation, jobs to pursue, in ways that allow them to completely avoid thinking about racial inequity or racial inequality. And then she talks about George Floyd and says the condemning of George Floyd was relatively costless, that who's going out on a limb when they're distancing themselves from a murderer? And on this recent you know, episode of Code Switch, she talked about how they wanted to see sympathy that white people had for the Black Lives Matter movement and found that it was at an all time high with George Floyd. One year later, they pulled those same white people again and found out you know, what is their sympathy for Black Lives Matter now? It was lower than what it had been before George Floyd was killed, lower. So it was like, oh, I feel bad, eh, no longer feel bad anymore. And out of all the people that they surveyed, only about 10% of white Americans actually felt like sympathy or compelled to action in terms of how they believed racism was having an impact on their lives. Um, and that's, that to me is really sobering. The fact that many white Americans are not only uh, passionate about like racism, but largely indifferent about racism and how it impacts other people. And Martin Luther King Jr. talks about this. He says whites, it must be frankly said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. It's an aspect of a sense of their superiority that white people in America believe they have so little to learn. The reality of substantial investment to assist Negroes in the 20th century, adjusting to Negro neighbors and genuine school integration is still a nightmare for all too many white Americans, still a nightmare. Sociologists have done studies that found when a neighborhood becomes more than 7% Black, 
7%, they put their homes on the market. When the neighborhood becomes more than 7% black, people are uncomfortable, it's time to sell, time to move. Uh, how, how do we even make sense of that? How do we even make sense of that? So I wanna, I wanna talk about violence and go back to violence because I think that again, it's so instructive. When we think about the civil rights movement, we think about this with rose-colored glasses. We look back on the civil rights movement as a time when white people and black people were holding hands and Kings giving great speeches and Rosa Parks is refusing to give up her seat on the bus. We have all of these romantic ideas about uh, that moment. And even this picture, just as a side note, I have to say that the picture of Rosa Parks is actually staged that the man sitting beside her is actually a journalist. And they posed her in this way to say, you know, sort of we'll sit you right here in the front and then just, you know, look out in the window. It's like you're looking at the distance, looking at a better future. But this picture is also so resonant because it marks the kind of activism that so many people wanted to see, which was hands clasped in your lap, not looking straight forward, off in the distance, this very passive, nonviolent form of activism. And which in this picture, Rosa Parks is not even centered. As Westerners, we're taught to read everything from, from left to right. So we don't even really see her first in the image. That is also political. Um, but that is the way that people wanted to see the civil rights movement. When really, the civil rights movement is about a response to violence. It's about violence at every single turn, violence in registering people to vote, violence against 14 year old little black boys, violence in, in lynching, violence with fire hoses um, leashed upon children, teenagers. It's about lunch counter uh, abuse and harassment. The civil rights movement is nothing but violence, um, deadly violence, verbal violence, but somehow we think of the Black Panthers as being like more scary than the Klan. <laughs> and I push, I, I show this because there's so many examples of violent death. But then when Black people use guns or arms to symbolically, I think that's really important, symbolically assert their Second Amendment rights, their ability to be able to protect themselves from corrupt um, you know, police departments. That's all that we focus on. But as a historian, again, I'm always going deeper. And one of the things I found out, not just in my own research, but from other Black Panther scholars, is that the Black Panther Party kind of relinquished their position on guns early on when they found out that it wasn't the most effective tool to getting towards liberation. They found, they found out that the most effective tools in the Black Panther Party was their breakfast program, was their uh, uh, sickle cell um, testing program, their public health programs, their ambulance programs, uh, their free food clinics, their educational or literacy programs, the schools that they had created. This is a picture of Rosa Parks visiting a Black Panther school. And this just made me think that, wow, when we think about real revolutionary action, the major threat of the Black Panther Party was not guns. The major threat to white supremacy was Black people who were fed and healthy and literate. Fed, healthy, and literate. That sparked the real fear by, by the FBI and Hoover and COINTELPRO and all of that. Um, the guns was, was the, like the symbolic superficial way of dismissing the Panthers. But the real work that was being done um, was what was most effective and impactful. Um, and there are people who would give testimony to this all day long. They will praise the Panthers, not because they protected them with guns, but because they fed them and taught them how to read and made sure that their mother's health was taken care of. Um, so when we think about the movement for Black lives, it's, it's just as simple as what the Black Panthers were trying to do. It's about protecting Black humanity, preserving Black humanity, getting people to acknowledge that Black people are human, which seems like a really low bar. Um, but it's, it's a starting place. Like BLM is not the, the where we finish. It's where we start the conversation. But I think when we think about the history of this, of these moments, of these movements, you know, Black people have always protested for their freedom, 
always, um, they've always spoken up against injustice. And what I found is that whether you take a knee or you throw a Molotov cocktail or you boycott or you vote, there's no form of, of white supremacy. There's no form of protest that white supremacy is going to approve of. There's no form of protest that white supremacy is gonna sanction and be like, you know what, I support this message. White supremacy does not want to be eradicated, right? White supremacists do not want to be eradicated. And so it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, Black people have been nonviolent and been murdered. Black people have used force and been murdered. Black people have used violent force and been murdered. Um, There is no form of protest that is not going to come up against um, some sort of violent confrontation from white supremacy. So what does that mean? Uh, I think it means a couple of things. I think we have to think about how do we go forward? I say to my students all the time, if this was your past and this was your present, what would you do to make sure that racism was not your future? What is gonna be the next image that your generation shows? Will it be better than the violence that we have constantly seen in my mother's generation? And now in my generation, I'm thinking about my children. So there's some hard, you know, uh, there's some hard things that we have to be honest about. And that is primarily in this country, racial violence those flows in one direction, almost always flows in one direction. We've seen this with the Dylan Roof and the Kyle Rittenhouse and the Heather Heyer. We've seen how people of color, Black people in particular, are almost always under attack and never the perpetrators of violence. We see this in mass shootings, be it Sandy Hook or Las Vegas, and we can go on and on and on when it comes to these mass shootings. Uh, and especially when it comes to the Capitol, right? You would never see, and that's one of the things we've talked about before, never see this um, Black people or BLM people doing this. And that is because the primary perpetrators of racial violence have not been Black people. And that is something that we have been unwilling to acknowledge that the primary perpetrators of racial violence have not been Black people, that the civil rights movement is not about nonviolence. It's about a response to violence, racialized, terroristic, white supremacist violence, and that the primary victims of racial violence have almost always been Black people and their allies. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? I think I'm gonna caution us to not come up with like three point plans. <laughs> I'm all, I'm totally like against that. I think oftentimes we're like, so what's the plan? So what are we gonna do? Give me your three points. That's not how this works. We've been doing it this for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. I do think that it is okay to follow the, the thought of Mary Macabre, who says, you're allowed to say not this, and keep it moving. (laughs) You're allowed to say, you know what? I don't know what the answer is, but not this. This ain't it. This isn't the solution. I don't know where we go from here, but I know what it isn't. And sometimes it's incredibly powerful to not necessarily know what a solution is, but to know what it isn't, to know what won't work, to know what has not been effective. I often think that in America, we have put too much emphasis on crime, criminality. And Marion Kaba also talks about how not all crimes are harms and not all harms are crimes. What matters most is what is harmful. What matters most is what is harmful. So when we go back to that Michigan State slide and we think about, you know, the fans that are tearing up the city and then the Baltimoreans that are that are angry and enraged, what is it that matters? The crime that's being committed or the harm the harm that is traumatizing communities because of police brutality, because of mass incarceration. Those are the things that we ought to be most focused on. So I wanna give you a couple things and start to wrap up. I know that people have been talking about books like crazy. A lot of people sold a lot of books last year Uh, and myself included, you know, I'm an author, I wanna sell books, that's great. But that is not a solution either. That at the end of the day, it's not going to be about what you read, but about what you did. It's not about what you read. I think reading is a first step. It's how you get information. It's how you get understanding. It's how you get, you know, wisdom. But it is not 
the last thing you do. It is not, okay, read that book. It was great. I'm changed, right? Like that, that is not sufficient. So I want to call us to move beyond literacy. For those who haven't embarked on literacy, yes, read, get books, get knowledge. Uh, and if you can't read, listen. If you can't listen, watch. There's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of documentaries. There's a lot of ways to get information. But then don't just sit with that. Let it mobilize you. Let it mobilize you. There's this great quote by Aimé Césaire in which he talks about us being spectators. And he says, beware of the crossing of your arms and the sterile attitude of the spectator because life is not a spectacle, because a sea of sorrows is not a theater. A man who screams is not a dancing bear. A man who screams is not a dancing bear. This is not a performance. Uh, Black pain is not performative. Um, and we have to be able to move beyond literacy and book reading and hand holding to get at the heart of the pain and the trauma and the violence that has wreaked havoc on so many people's lives, to get at the spirit of slavery, as Joshua Easton would say. But I want to I want to wrap up and I want to end with this. I'm going to end with a couple things actually, but we'll start with this because I always want to end on a high note. I want to give you hope. Uh, Imani Perry says something that has stuck with me every single day since I've read it. She says, racism is terrible, blackness is not. Racism is terrible, blackness is not. And this is a lengthy quote, but it is worth reading. She says, American racism is unquestionably rapacious. To identify the achievement and acceleration in black life is not to mute or minimize racism, but to shame racism, to damn it to hell. The masters were wrong in the antebellum South when they described the body shaking delighted chuckle of an enslaved person as simple mindedness. No, that laugh, like our music, like our language, like our movement, was a testimony that refused the terms of our degradation. In the footage of the protests over the past several weeks, we have seen Black people dancing, chanting, singing, do not misunderstand. This is not an absence of grief or rage or distraction. It is insistence. It is insistence. Um, so with that, I know we're like running out of time, but and I had I had two more slides to show you, but I will save it for QA. But I just want to say that at the end of the day, we are not fighting blackness. We are fighting white supremacy. We are fighting racism. And it's not blackness that is terrible, it's racism. So I'm going to end uh, right there. Should I stop sharing my screen? Oh, let me go back. Let me, there we go. Thank you. I love that. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was incredible. I just love that because I have to say, like, I find peace. I'm one of those people that I find a little bit of resolve and comfort in just learning. And I feel like you just gave us the master class in 45. You know, like, we just got it say the kids got to sign up for school they got to fill out the paperwork packet do all that and we just got it so i appreciate that i want to jump right in um you didn't do too much i think you fed our spirit and i so appreciate you for doing that i want to ask some questions and then we have some questions in the chat I want to remind everyone if you have questions in the chat we're only going to get a couple so we want to be respectful of everybody's time today but um i love so many things that you've said. Uh, one of the things that I want to ask you, and we talked about, there, there's this overwhelming need, as you note, to frame historical Black movements as nonviolent, mm -hmm. to have Rosa Parks in the picture with her arms crossed and her head down. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that is both, frankly, in the historical narrative, but also in the media narrative? And how do we need to think about expanding the definitions mm -hmm. of what those movements has been as we frame what needs to be considered in the movements moving forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's not just Rosa Parks, that's King as well. That so many other leaders have been we have given the narrative that their strength is passivity, that their strength is like, that nonviolence is most importantly non-threatening. <laughs> that it's not scary, it's not terrifying, and it doesn't really compel people to action. Um, and that I think has been what's been so disappointing or dis disturbing to me 
and even Rosa Parks, who talked about the fact that like she wanted to speak up, but like we don't quote, we don't even quote Rosa Parks. I mean, we quote King a lot, but like Rosa had a lot to say. Um, but we have muted her and we have muted her activism. Um, and and I think it is a huge disservice, a huge disservice. And instead of compelling people to action, it really compels them to apathy. That I don't have to do much to bring about change. And that is absolutely not true. Yeah, I love that. Cause it also makes me think if, if it allows us to believe that somehow you can't you can do this work without being uncomfortable. Um, oh yeah, you can do this work while, while tweeting, right? While, you know, <laughs> while smiling all the time, you know, it's like not for real. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a question that came to us in the chat. It's about COVID-19 and whether or not you believe that even though uh, communities of color were disproportionately impacted in the death and outcomes, that the responsivity would have been the same if it wasn't having such a devastating impact on white communities. That was one of the mm. questions that came to us from Bruce. Bruce, thank you for that question. Man, so it's a good question. My husband and I were kind of having a cynical conversation in which uh, this was maybe April, maybe May, I'm not sure on the month of 2020. And they had started to come out with the numbers talking about the, the uh, disproportionate rates of people of color, disproportionate rates of, of Black people who were dying from this. And my husband said, oh, that's it. That's the end of the pandemic. And I said, what do you mean? And he was like, Nobody cares about black death. Nobody cares about us dying. Like if this were about the wealthy, sure. Like if this were about white people, and I I know that's a very cynical way to think about it, but in some ways, he's not wrong. Like I, when we see things that we feel like don't impact us, don't um don't alter our lives. When Jen Chudy gives those statistics about how white people buy homes, put their kids in schools, go on vacation in which they don't ever have to see a person of color, then of course it would make sense to them that this would not matter because who do I know? Who do I go to school with? Who do I live next door to? Who am I going to visit that looks like someone um, who has been hurt by this or harmed by this or sick by this? I had a white person tell me, you know, honestly, I don't know anybody that's gotten COVID. And I was like, whoa. Like, I know people that have died. And she was like, I mean, I, I know a few people that have gotten sick, but you know, they were fine. And that just, that shocked me. That yeah. shocked me that she was so insulated. And this was over the summer when we were still having peaks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do think that that has a huge impact on how we have taken um, the seriousness of, of COVID. I love that because it feeds into a question from Adam Grant. Adam, thank you. It's how do we raise the argument from one of zero sum game to that this work is a rising tide, that if we lift everyone, the collective lifts. How do you think we should oh. be thinking about that? Don't you love that question? It feeds. I love that. I, love, I, I stand by that. that. I stand by that. <laughs> Motto, I mean, lift while we climb. Like that is what the National Association of Colored Women, that was their anchor. That was yeah. their motto. Um, and I believe in that wholeheartedly. We do not live in a world of scarcity. Not really. Yeah. People are hoarding. White people are hoarding, right? Like, let's just have honest conversations because we have, I mean, this is the thing. If everybody has a home, that does not mean that, oh, that's the end of it. If everybody gets educated, somehow education doesn't matter. If, if everyone's employed, you know, that these things lose their specialness about them it's just not true there is enough um there's enough health to go around there's enough wealth to go around there's enough housing to go around there's enough education to go around um but because of capitalism and a lot of other things we live by quota systems only so many people can be successful only so many people can win somebody's gotta lose somebody's gotta lose i just i wholeheartedly push back on that i think that the only way America is going to be great is if the people who are at the bottom, who are most marginalized, have what they need, have their needs met. I love that. You know, when the pandemic first started, my brother and I talked about this a lot. And he, his observation was that, you know, it's humans as an animal, we're the only animal in nature that feels the need to hoard. 
Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. were out and sort of buying and buying too much. And he was like, it's just, it tells you sort of as a creature of how we sort of evolved and it's dangerous. But I agree with you because we measure so much of our success based not on just what we have, but whether or not I have more than somebody else. Mm-hmm. Another question that has come up in the chat is in regard to the powerless building power, could it be equated to aiming to decentralize the centralized control system? Mm. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know. Damari is also giving us alliteration riffs. So we love how poetically. I, the I think correct. that at the end of the day, if we want to see the change that we, uh, or the world that we sort of all aspire to live in, you have to have uh, gross appropriation, reappropriation of resources, reappropriation of wealth, reparations, you have to repair the harm that was done. And I'm not just talking about like money or financially. I mean, there is real trauma and harm associated with racism. That's not just like the eight cents that black people own or or have in their their bank accounts. there is a real shifting of power that has to happen. Um, And I think, you know, the thing with white supremacy is that it teaches even poor white people not to relinquish the power and the privileges or the advantages that come with the whiteness. Um, And that to me, you know, the thing that people don't understand is that white supremacy even hurts white supremacists. (laughs) That everyone is harmed. Everyone is harmed by this. Um, no one is winning, you know what I mean? Uh, not, not in a real sense, not in a soulful sense. Um, so yes, I absolutely think that there has to be like, uh, drastic changes that are, that are made. It doesn't have to be violence. It doesn't have to be violence. I think we look at violence as a pinpoint for that, but, um, I often think that violence is not about violence for violence sake. I often think people often use it from a defensive perspective to arrest the violence that they themselves are experiencing. I love it. Listen, you guys, the chat, the questions are lighting up and I apologize, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. I encourage you, tweet Kelly on Twitter, get your questions out there. We'll try to respond to them. Hashtag justice, that's just, tag the foundation, tag Kelly, we'll get to some of these questions. Kelly, I thank you so much for being here. You're Thank in- you, You're thank you, me peace. wonderful. Bye. We're going to take a quick break, guys, and we'll be back with the next panel. Thank you for joining us this afternoon at Justice That's Just.